Welcome to today's lesson. Today we will be analyzing West Indies, USA. There are some poems that look simple that are actually complicated. On the other hand, there are some poems like this one that look really complex and messy but are actually straightforward. Don't be intimidated by this poem's form and length. In no time, you will have a full understanding of this poem. First, I'll read the poem. Then I'll summarize the literal happenings, and then we'll analyze deeply. Welcome back to Between the Lines. West Indies, USA by Stuart Brown Cruising at 30,000 feet above the endless green, the islands seem like dice tossed on a casino's base. Some come up lucky, others not. Puerto Rico takes the pot, the Dallas of the West Indies. Silver linings on the clouds as we descend are hallmarked. San Juan glitters like a maverick's gold ring. All across the Caribbean, we'd collected terminals. Airports are like calling cards, cultural finger marks. The handwritten signs of Port-au-Prince, Piarco's sleazy tourist art, the lethargic contempt of the baggage boys at Veer Bird in St. John's, and now for plush San Juan. But the pilot's bland, you're safe in my hands, drawl crackles as we land. US regulations demand all passengers not disembarking at San Juan stay on the plane. I repeat, stay on the plane. Subtle Uncle Sam, afraid too many desperate blacks might re-enslave this island of the free, might jump the barbed electric fence around America's backyard and claim that vaunted sanctuary. Give me your poor. Through toughened tinted glass, the contrasts tantalize. US patrol cars glide across the shimmering tarmac. Containered baggage trucks unload with fierce efficiency. So soon, we're climbing. Low above the pulsing city streets, galvanized shanties overseen by condominiums, polished Cadillacs shimmying past rastas with pushcarts. And as we climb, San Juan's fool's glitter calls to mind the shattered innards of a TV set that's fallen off the back of a lorry. All painted valves and circuits, the roads like twisted wires. The bright car's microchips. It's sharp and jagged and dangerous, and belonged to someone else. So what's going on literally here? Let's take it stanza by stanza. The speaker is on a plane. He's flying over the Caribbean. Because he's so high up, he can see the islands below him. He notices that some islands look more prosperous than others. In particular, Puerto Rico seems to be looking quite rich. He says it is the Dallas of the West Indies. Dallas is a modern metropolis in Texas, USA, and overall a nice place to live. So the speaker is saying Puerto Rico is the most prosperous, or one of the most prosperous countries in the region. I'll explain the many imageries and metaphors in the stanza later on. For now, let's go to stanza 2. The speaker is reflecting on the various airports that the Caribbean countries have. The airports sort of represent how rich or poor the countries are. Port-au-Prince belongs to Haiti, and we see that they have handwritten signs there, which basically means Haiti is a poor country. Next, we see Piarco, which is in Trinidad and Tobago. There we see some sleazy, some cheap, ugly tourist art. Next, we see St. John's from Antigua and Barbuda, which is also described negatively. We'll get into it later, but finally we come to San Juan, which of course is in Puerto Rico. This airport, unlike the others, is described positively. It is said to be plush, which basically means fancy and sophisticated. In the deep analysis, I'll go through every piece of imagery in the stanza, so don't worry about it. In stanza 3, the plane arrives at Puerto Rico. The pilot makes an announcement that all passengers whose destination is not San Juan should stay on the plane, meaning as the plane stops for a while, they will not be allowed to go outside and have a look around. The speaker mentions in stanzas 3 and 4 that America does not want too many desperate black people entering Puerto Rico, as they might cause some trouble. Puerto Rico is described as America's backyard because of its connection to the US. 
We even see some US patrol cars on the tarmac. They are there to make sure the desperate blacks don't get off the plane. In the next stanza, we see that the plane takes off again. In the second to last stanza, as the plane flies over the city, the speaker sees several things. He sees things that indicate wealth, such as Cadillacs, but he also sees things that indicate poverty, such as Rastas with pushcarts. In this stanza and in the last one, the speaker describes San Juan as a broken TV set. We'll get into it later. So now we have an overview of what is literally going on in the poem. This analysis will be longer than most others, not because the poem is difficult, but because the poem is long and packed with many imageries and metaphors. I'll go through line by line and discuss every detail so you can have a fulsome understanding of this poem. Alright, time for the real analysis. Let's start with the title, West Indies, USA. The title is very appropriate for the poem, as the poem actually describes through contrasting imageries the West Indies and the USA. In this case, Puerto Rico is used to represent the US, as it is a territory owned by the US. There are many differences between the West Indies and the US. One of the main differences that this poem focuses on is the economic positions of these two places. The USA is a first world country, and many see this place as the land of opportunity, even the promised land. In contrast, the West Indies, the Caribbean, are often described as a third world region or a developing region, meaning we're not as economically powerful as countries like the US, the UK, Canada, and Japan. There's another significance of the title. Look at how it is written. West Indies, comma, USA. It's like an address, like saying Kingston, comma, Jamaica, or Dallas, comma, Texas. What is the effect of all this? Well, the title could suggest that the West Indies is somehow owned by the US, or it is like a colony or territory of the USA, just as Kingston is owned by, or is a part of, or is a subset of Jamaica, and Dallas is owned by, or is a part of, or is a subset of Texas. Understanding this implication of the title, what could we expect to see in this poem? Certainly, we can expect to see some kind of socio-political commentary. The poem might go on to talk about how the USA is controlling or trying to control the West Indies, about how the USA owns or thinks it owns the West Indies. Note also that the West Indies, even though it is one region, is made of many countries, and these countries have very different cultures, even different languages. Look at how many countries there are in the West Indies. Yet, looking at the title, we see that the whole region is crumpled up into one little ball as if it's just one country. The USA, according to the title, probably doesn't care about the individualities, the uniqueness of each country in the West Indies, of Guyana, of Barbados, of St. Kitts. They just see us as a bunch of little islands to be owned. You might say I'm speaking too strongly about the title, but remember, there's a historical context and also a present political and social context that we must consider. The West Indies has a history that involves slavery and colonization. Until recently, West Indian countries were owned, controlled by big, powerful countries, and the title might be suggesting that this is still a reality in some way. Think about how Americanized Caribbean countries are. The saying goes, if America sneezes, Jamaica catches a cold. Even today, in many ways, we can see how the West Indies is subjected to, subservient to the US. Does the speaker believe that the West Indies is actually owned by the US? Does the speaker believe that we should be owned by the US? I don't think so. I think the poem will present to us a lot of satire and sarcasm. Overall, the poem is satirical, which means the speaker is really talking about some political, some social issue. They're trying to bring something to our attention something we might not be realizing. Let's analyze stanza one. Line one, we see that the speaker is in the air. He's cruising at 30,000 feet above the endless green. He's high up and below him he sees land and water. This looks to him like an endless green. Since he says cruising, we get the sense that he's comfortable. 
Maybe he is on a vacation. He probably travels frequently throughout the Caribbean. After all, he seems to know a lot about various Caribbean countries. He seems to be in a position to be aware of what is happening across the region. Not only can he literally see the islands below him, but his experiences make him able to understand the situations of the islands. In the next line, we have an interesting simile. The islands seem like dice tossed on a casino's bays. First question, what is a bays? This is a plush velvet material that is used to cover the tables at a casino. Of course, on the tables, people roll dice and play cards. So with the dice being tossed on the bays, we're getting the imagery of a casino. Why do the islands seem like dice? What does that mean? Well, the next line will explain that some islands come up lucky and others do not. When you're at a casino throwing dice, it's all about luck. You want to get those lucky numbers to win lots of money. Get the wrong numbers and you lose lots of money instead. So the speaker is really saying that some of the islands are luckier than others. Some islands are in a good position while others are not. But why did the simile take us to dice in a casino? What might the dice themselves represent? They could signify things like chance or luck. They could also signify fate or destiny. Maybe some islands are destined to be rich and some are destined to be poor. Another meaning of this imagery is that just as tiny dice scatter across the large casino table, the islands from way up high look tiny and scattered like dice, or even like the numbers on the dice. This scattering of the islands might represent a disunity, division within the West Indies. Each little island is doing its own thing, playing its own game. On to line 3, we see that some countries are luckier than others, but which is the luckiest? Certainly it is Puerto Rico. This country takes the pot. Again, this is a casino metaphor. What is the pot? The pot here, or the jackpot, means all the money on the table. In a game of poker, for example, the pot is all of the chips or all of the money that the players bet. Whoever wins the pot wins everything. So obviously, Puerto Rico is very lucky. They're very rich. So Puerto Rico, according to the speaker, is the most well-off country in the West Indies. Note the diction in take the pot. They didn't just win or get or collect the pot, they took it! Sounds forceful. Remember, in a game of poker, the pot is made up of all the other players' money. So whoever wins the pot is actually taking money from everyone else. In this metaphor, we get the sense that Puerto Rico is well off because they have taken money. They have taken opportunity from other countries or because they were given their wealth and status by the biggest international criminal in history, the USA. In the next line, there is yet another metaphor, which is also an illusion. Puerto Rico is said to be the Dallas of the West Indies. As mentioned in the summary of the poem, Dallas is a big, fairly rich city. Puerto Rico is compared to that city. Dallas and Texas on a whole made its fortune by being rich in oil. But the real significance of the comparison between Puerto Rico and Dallas is in the history. Puerto Rico is now a part of the US, but that wasn't always the case. In 1917, Puerto Rico became a US territory and the citizens of Puerto Rico became citizens of the US. But the geopolitics of Puerto Rico are complicated. It's not a country, so it's not an independent nation like Jamaica or Barbados or Guyana. But at the same time, even though it's a territory of the US, it's not a US state. So they're kind of in a strange middle ground. Puerto Rico is also in a middle ground between being a Caribbean, a West Indian territory, and being a part of the US. Just as how the US acquired Puerto Rico, they also acquired Texas, which includes Dallas, from Mexico in 1845. So going back to the poem, the speaker is saying just as how the US attached Texas unto itself, it attached Puerto Rico unto itself. 
it stole Puerto Rico. But the big difference between Texas and Puerto Rico is that Puerto Rico is not a US state. This will be important later. We get both imagery and metaphor. The speaker is looking down at literal clouds. Remember, he's in a plane. He says there are silver linings on the clouds as he descends over San Juan, the capital of Puerto Rico. When the sun is directly behind a cloud, you may see a bright outline of that cloud. This is called a silver lining. Metaphorically, a silver lining means hope or opportunity when things are bad. So basically, the cloud represents a bad situation, while the sun behind it represents the hope. The speaker says that the clouds over San Juan have silver linings. This means this is a territory that has a lot of hope, potential, opportunity. The silver linings around the clouds could also provide an imagery of smoke going up into the clouds. This smoke comes up from the factories, from vehicles, from the industrialized and modernized infrastructure. There is air pollution, but that is really a sign of the country's advancement. In the next line, we see that these silver linings are what? Hallmarked. What does that mean? A hallmark is a brand or seal, some kind of special sign that may be on some name brand items. When you see a genuine hallmark on a Rolex or a pair of Clarks, you know they're real, they're not fakes. So here, the clouds above San Juan, the silver linings, the opportunities are hallmarked, they're genuine. This is the place in the West Indies where you can make real money, where you can live big dreams and drive the best cars and live in the nicest houses. Going into the next line, we get more imagery of wealth. San Juan glitters like a maverick's gold ring. This is a metaphor. A maverick is someone who does not follow the rules. He might be an outlaw, a gangster, someone who doesn't conform, someone who obtains his wealth dishonestly. So here we see that San Juan is glittering like a gold ring, which means they're rich. But also we get the idea that their wealth was acquired unfairly. Also, it might suggest that Puerto Rico does not conform to the West Indies. In other words, even though it is geographically close to these other countries, Jamaica, Barbados and so on, it is very different from them. How is it different? It is rich and it belongs to the USA. Let's recap stanza 1. We see the speaker flying over the West Indies. We see that not all islands, not all territories, have the same luck. Some are better off than others. Puerto Rico is the wealthiest. We see a lot of imagery of wealth and success in how Puerto Rico is described. The speaker is descending on San Juan, so the plane is going to land soon. As we are about to move to the next stanza, we see that the stanzas after the first one are all indented. Why does this poem look so weird? There are several possible reasons, but the main one is this. Stanza 1 is different from the rest of the poem. Why? Because stanza 1 is a narration, while the rest of the poem is a description. When you're writing an essay, you should be able to talk about why the poem is structured the way it is. That is why looking at form and structure is really important. In stanza 1, the speaker tells us of a particular experience. He tells us of his trip over the West Indies and his descent on San Juan. The rest of the poem will actually tell us what the speaker sees when he lands in San Juan. So in stanza 1, he is 30,000 feet in the air, and then he lands. From stanza 2 to the end, he is describing and reflecting on what he sees after he lands. Let's go to stanza 2. The first two lines say, All across the Caribbean, we had collected terminals. Airports are like calling cards. First, the countries were like dice. Now we see that the airports are like calling cards. This is a simile, but what does it mean? A calling card is a small printed card which identifies the person who wears it. It is like a name card, a name tag. The speaker says that the Caribbean countries all collected terminals, which are the buildings in airports where passengers can board planes. Just as how the countries were like dice, meaning some were luckier and wealthier than others, now the countries collected terminals and the airports are like calling cards. Just as a calling card is used to identify or represent someone, the airports can be used to identify or represent a country. If you see an airport, you can have a good idea of how rich or poor, how polite or impolite, how safe or unsafe the country is on a whole. Basically, you can judge a country by its airport. 
The simile of airports being called calling cards is extended in the next line, as they are said to be cultural finger marks. A finger mark is a spot of dirt left by a dirty finger. So the speaker is saying, you can see how dirty, how messy, how poor certain countries are by seeing the condition of their airports. Finger mark here is also close in meaning to fingerprint, meaning you can tell a country's identity, their cultural identity, their economic standing by looking at their airport. The rest of the stanza goes on to describe how several countries' airports look. We see handwritten signs at Port-au-Prince, which is in Haiti. While most airports would certainly have well-made signs printed in large, clear fonts, it seems the airport in Haiti has handwritten signs. Haiti, historically, has been one of the poorest countries in the world. The signs are handwritten because the country is poor. They cannot afford to make printed signs. We see sleazy tourist art in Piarco, which is Trinidad's national airport. Sleazy means inferior, low quality. The art at this airport is cheap. Sleazy also means perverted, tastelessly sexual. Whatever meaning you pay attention to, sleazy is the opposite of classy, plush. Next, we go to St. John's, which is the capital of Antigua and Barbuda. At this airport, we see the lethargic contempt of the baggage boys. This is a very interesting description of the baggage boys. Lethargic means lazy, sluggish, sleepy. We see that the baggage boys are slow. They're unprofessional, inefficient. The customer service is poor here. In this case, contempt means disrespect or disobedience. So basically, you aren't getting any good service at this airport. Then we see the ellipsis, which means something grand is coming. Something different is coming. Next, we see the description of San Juan, where the speaker has actually landed. How is this airport described? It is said to be plush. Plush means sophisticated. It is the opposite of the previously described airports. Instead of handwritten signs, they have fancy well-made billboards. Instead of sleazy tourist art, they have pristine artworks and grand sculptures and statues. Instead of lazy luggage boys, they have efficient professionals who get things done. The most important devices in this stanza are imagery and contrast. We see the poor, dirty, unprofessional airports. And then this is contrasted with the plush San Juan. The actual plane landing happens in stanza 3. The pilot tells the passengers that they are safe in his hands. His voice is described as a crackling drawl. A drawl is like a slow, lazy speech, one that is sometimes associated with Texas, where we have Dallas, which was previously compared to San Juan. His voice is a drawl because he has no enthusiasm. He's just reading off a script, basically. His drawl crackles because it is heard through the plane's speakers. His voice doesn't sound full and clear, but sounds tinny and probably difficult to understand. Then we have some direct speech from the pilot. These are in quotes because they are the pilot's exact words, and also because they are an important announcement. US regulations demand all passengers not disembarking at San Juan stay on the plane. I repeat, stay on the plane. So the pilot announces that those passengers whose destination is not San Juan should stay on board. He even repeats the announcement to make sure everyone hears. In the next few lines, the poem becomes very direct. Look at the next two lines. Subtle Uncle Sam, afraid too many desperate blacks might re-enslave this island of the free. Here, Uncle Sam metonymically represents the USA. A metonym is a type of metaphor, as I explain in other videos. So the speaker says that Uncle Sam is subtle. But this is sarcastic. To be subtle means to be tactful, sensitive, indirect, careful with your words. But actually, Uncle Sam, or the US, is being very straightforward, very to the point, not subtle at all. The announcement the pilot made was very harsh. Obviously, the US doesn't want these black people on the flight running around in San Juan. The US is afraid that too many desperate blacks might re-enslave Puerto Rico. Clearly, we are in the realm of prejudice, racism. First of all, calling black people blacks is pretty racist, in my opinion. At the very least, it is insensitive. It is a very crude way of referring to a group of people. Look at those blacks sitting over there. Hmm? Also, they are said to be desperate. Remember, this is sarcastic, as the speaker is telling us what he thinks America thinks about us. The US, according to the speaker, thinks that we are desperate, poor, struggling. 
We are desperate for food and money. We have nothing. They fear that we might re-enslave this island of the free. Here we have irony and more sarcasm. They are afraid that the black people will re-enslave Puerto Rico. Weren't black people the ones who were enslaved in the first place? Yet they are fearing that we will enslave them. Perhaps they fear the vengeance of the blacks. Given the chance, we might do to them what they did to us. Or maybe re-enslavement refers to poverty. Maybe the U.S. fears that the desperate blacks from the Caribbean will make Puerto Rico a slave to poverty. Puerto Rico is called the island of the free, which is sarcastic. The territory is not free because it is owned by the U.S. How stupid of them to fret about black people re-enslaving them when they are already enslaved by the U.S. How ironic. Also, Island of the Free is an allusion. It alludes to the U.S. national anthem, in which there's a line, Land of the Free and Home of the Brave. So Puerto Rico is wealthy compared to its West Indian neighbors, but it is property of the U.S. Is it really worth it to be wealthy if you're not free? By the way, another reason why Island of the Free is sarcastic is that the people on the plane aren't free to go there. Puerto Rico shuts out the people from the neighboring countries. Going down to the next stanza, we see that they fear that the desperate blacks might jump the barbed electric fence around America's backyard. The electric fence is a metaphor that I think refers to prisons. Prisons are guarded by electric fences. If a prisoner tries to escape, he will be electrocuted. So the West Indies is like a prison that we're trying to escape. But interestingly, the electric fence isn't around the West Indies, is it? It is around where? Puerto Rico. This ties back into the sarcasm of Island of the Free. It is Puerto Rico that is actually imprisoned. In any case, the speaker says that Uncle Sam is afraid the black people will try to enter and ruin Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is called America's backyard. This has several political and historical implications, but basically this means that Puerto Rico is seen as property of the US. Uncle Sam is afraid that the blacks will jump the fence and claim that vaunted sanctuary. Something that is vaunted is praised, held in high esteem. Puerto Rico is a sanctuary of the US. This is because the US owns and protects Puerto Rico. Also, a sanctuary is a haven, a safe zone. So basically, Puerto Rico is the safe zone in the Caribbean, the oasis in the desert. And the US fears that the countries around it will try to sneak in, invade and take over. Then we see in quotes, give me your poor. Two things are special about these words. They are in quotes, which means they are someone's exact words. And there is an ellipsis, which means it is only a part of a speech, something is missing. Who is saying these words? Well, these words are actually a quote from a poem named New Colossus, written by Emma Lazarus. And so these words are an allusion. What's so special about this poem? It's actually mounted inside the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. Listen to the last stanza of that poem that is actually embedded into the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. <laughs> Basically, the Statue of Liberty, the symbol of freedom, is calling everyone, the poor, the beaten, the oppressed, to come to America and be free. Come to this great land of equality, of opportunity. So looking back at the poem, the line, give me your poor, is said sarcastically. The speaker is saying, you promised to help the poor, but actually you're just oppressing them even more. See, even that rhymed, didn't it? You're locking them out. You're shutting the door on them. We can't even get off the plane and touch the soil here in Puerto Rico. Let's look at the next line. Through toughened tinted glass, the contrasts tantalize. What is the glass here? It is the window of the airplane. Why is the window described as tough and tinted? Why this kind of imagery? It is to highlight the fact that the plane windows are made to be a barrier between the speaker and Puerto Rico. The windows are tinted, so he can't even see outside clearly. He's not allowed outside. We even hear some tough alliteration in toughened, tinted, and contrast, tantalize. Speaking of contrast, we see that the contrast tantalize. If something is tantalizing, it is tempting, it is desirable, it is intriguing. 
The speaker, as he looks through the plane window, can see a contrast, a difference between Puerto Rico and the West Indies. He sees that Puerto Rico looks more appealing. We know this because he says the contrasts tantalize. In the next line, he describes what he sees. U.S. patrol cars glide across the shimmering tarmac. The cars are gliding, so they're moving quickly, efficiently, smoothly. The tarmac is shimmering, so the road is well-made and well-maintained. The patrol cars are there to make sure the people on the plane don't try to get off and create any trouble. Remember, the black people on the plane are poor, desperate troublemakers. The shimmering tarmac reminds us of the glitters from stanza 1. In the next stanza, we see containered baggage trucks unloading with fierce efficiency. This means the baggage trucks are quick and efficient. They're getting things done swiftly. This contrasts with the lazy luggage boys we saw in St. John's. Why is the efficiency fierce? Because the people dealing with the luggage want to hurry up so the plane can take off again, so the people on board can quickly leave Puerto Rico. The next line confirms, so soon we're climbing. The baggage workers work efficiently so that the plane can take off quickly. As the plane takes off, the speaker gets a chance to see what's happening in the city of San Juan. All along, we were getting speculations and suppositions, but now we have actual details. This is a clear view of what is really happening. The city streets are said to be pulsing, much like a heart pulses. This metaphor means that the city is full of life and vitality. Bright lights, fast cars, tall buildings, large crowds, busy streets. Then we see galvanized shanties. Hmm, what are shanties? They're cheaply built houses, or maybe even huts, shacks. The shanties are said to be galvanized. This has two meanings. Something is galvanized when it is coated by a thin sheet of metal, particularly zinc. So we see the image of small huts with zinc roofs. Is this really San Juan? Why are we seeing shacks with zinc roofs? This certainly isn't an image of luxury. To galvanize also means to energize, to charge, to shock, to stimulate. We get the feeling that there's a lot of activity happening in and around these shanties. Maybe people are scurrying about, trying to make a living, hustling, scampering. These shanties, these houses, are owned obviously by the poor people. And they are overseen by condominiums. There are two meanings of condominiums that are applicable here. First, these could be residential complexes, large apartment buildings. So we see the contrast of a more modern, more urban living situation and a poor, lowly living situation. A condominium is also a region that is owned by two or more countries. This ties back to the US's ownership of Puerto Rico. The speaker says that the shanties are overseen by the condominiums. This establishes the relationship between the shanties and the condominiums, between the rich and the poor. Overseen has three meanings that I want you to pay attention to. One, something that is overseen by something else is geographically or physically lower than that thing. For example, the sea is overseen by the mountains, or the mountains overlook the sea. It just means the mountain is higher than the sea. So here we see tall buildings that are higher than the small poor houses. To oversee also means to be in charge of. If I oversee a project, I supervise it, I am in charge of it. So here, we see that the rich have power over the poor. Finally, to oversee something means to neglect it. In this way, the word is a synonym for overlook. So we see the rich ignoring or disregarding the poor. So we see, with all of these meanings, overseen is actually an important word in the line, and one that enforces the theme of socio-economic division and imbalance in the country. In the next line, we see another contrast of rich and poor. We see polished Cadillacs shimmying past Rastas with pushcarts. The Cadillacs are polished, they're shiny, new, gleaming. The Cadillacs don't just drive past the Rastas, they shimmy past them. Shimmying is a kind of shaking, vibration. Maybe due to nervousness, the language tells us the attitude of the Cadillac drivers. They don't want to be near the Rastas, they look at the Rastas with disgust, with contempt. They hurriedly drive past. So while the speaker was on the tarmac, and even while he was approaching San Juan, he got the impression that San Juan was all sunshine and rainbows. It appeared as if the whole country was rich, but now he's getting a closer look. And after all, it's not the paradise that it appeared to be. 
we see that within San Juan is a division, a clear distinction between the rich and the poor. So here we explore the theme of appearance versus reality. Sometimes we dream of going to a certain country. We think that once we get there, life will be better for us. But after reaching there, we start to see the problems that exist there, the injustices, the inequalities. After all, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. As the plane rises, the speaker refers to what he sees as San Juan's fool's glitter. This is a metaphor. The word glitter here alludes to the proverb, not all that glitters is gold, which means not everything that looks good is really good. Puerto Rico looks rich, looks great, but is it really? Those who are fooled by this glitter, by the flashy cars and tall buildings and the bright lights are fools, according to the speaker. He says that this fool's glitter reminds him of the shattered innards of a TV that's fallen off the back of a lorry. Imagine a TV that has fallen off the back of a truck. Such a TV would be shattered. That is what is meant by shattered innards. The innards of something are the insides. If something is broken on the inside, it can still look good on the outside. And this is the situation of San Juan, of Puerto Rico. The speaker continues to compare San Juan to a broken TV set. The beauty of the town is like the painted valves and circuits within the TV. But remember, these valves and circuits are broken because the TV had fallen off the lorry. But even though they are broken, the paint on them makes them look new. Similarly, San Juan looks beautiful from the outside, but is really a broken city. One in which there are many people struggling. In the next line, we have a simile that continues this comparison. Now the roads of San Juan are compared to twisted wires. The image of twisted wires is one of confusion and malfunction. Finally, we come to the last stanza. We see bright cars and microchips, which again are images of development, progress, even technological advancement. We can also see the bright cars, microchips, as a continuation of the metaphor of the broken TV and San Juan. Just as the roads are like twisted wires, the cars are like microchips. With microchips, we also get the connotation of surveillance, as if the US is keeping an eye on Puerto Rico, maybe on the Caribbean, maybe on the whole world. They are always watching, making sure things are going their way. There is another meaning to this broken TV metaphor. This TV might represent media. Media is used to program or brainwash the masses with lies. Think about it, most of what we see on TV is fake. Movies and TV shows are obviously fake, but even the news is often fake. Advertisements are deceptive. Similarly, the beauty of Puerto Rico is just an illusion, it's not real. Anyway, what is the speaker's attitude toward the high standard of living that some people can enjoy in San Juan? It is sharp and jagged and dangerous. What is dangerous? Money and success? No, the fact that there is such a steep divide between the rich and the poor. Some people are in mansions while others are in shacks. Some people drive Cadillacs while others push carts. The inequality and oppression within the city are appalling to the speaker. And as we end, we see that all this wealth within the city belonged to someone else. This has three meanings. One, Puerto Rico is now owned by the US but only because the US stole it. Two, the residents of Puerto Rico, or at least some of them, might enjoy a high standard of living, but their wealth is not their own. It is just lent to them by their owner, the US. And three, it might be a callback to slavery and to the fact that the US and everything that it has built was built on the backs of slaves. The US is a successful world power only because they have historically exploited weaker countries. As we wrap up this extensive analysis, let's recap some major themes that we have encountered in the poem. We see appearance versus reality, as a country might have a plush reputation, might look appealing, tempting, tantalizing, all while having its own demons to battle. San Juan was painted to be a well-off country but we see that many people who live there are poor, oppressed. We see a theme of national identity. The West Indies, from the title of the poem, has been painted as identity-less, or at least heavily influenced by the US. Also, we see that Puerto Rico has something of an identity crisis. 
It is in the West Indies geographically, but it is a US territory. Still, it's not a US state, nor is it its own nation. We see classism in the contrasts of wealth versus poverty, particularly in the images we see in the city of San Juan. We see Cadillacs shimmying past pushcarts, and condominiums overlooking shanties, and so on. We also see racial prejudice, racism. We see how the US perceives the West Indians. It's not just because we are from the West Indies, but also because we're black. The black people are painted to be criminals, savages, uneducated people, just waiting to create problems the first chance they get. We get the theme of struggle to escape history. Slavery and colonization happened in the West Indies hundreds of years ago. Yet it seems the effects of those times are still very present today. It is as if we can't recover from those times, economically or socially. This has been a long analysis. If you've made it to the end, big up yourself. See you again in between the lines.